Hello, everybody. My name is Sandra, and I'm in recovery from sexual, physical, and emotional abuse, codependency, and love and relationships. <laughs> hello, hello. Let's pray. Father, I just thank you, Lord. Thank you because you're the God of all our days, Lord, because you stay the same, Father, no matter where we're at, no matter what we go through, Lord, you are always the same, Father. You're never changing. And I thank you for that. Thank you for this place, Father, where we can come, Father, and, and glorify you, Jesus, and allow you to change our lives, Lord. Thank you for everyone that works here. Thank you for the safe place where we can come. In Jesus' name, I pray that, Father, you give me clarity as I speak, Father, that you prepare the hearts, all of our hearts, to hear from you, Lord, that you remind us that this is not about me, Father, but about your story in me. So I thank you for your grace, for your mercy, for your love, Father, that allows me to stand here today because without you, Father, I would never have been able to stand here. So I thank you for your mighty grace and love. In Jesus' name I pray, amen, amen. I was born in Cuba and I am the oldest of three to a typical Cuban family where verbal abuse, codependency are just part of the culture. Our family got together every weekend to drink and party, some good chaotic family fun. Luckily for me, I love to dance salsa and it's impossible to do sharp turns and drink, so I never drank much. I was pretty sick most of my life because I was born with urinary tract dysfunction and was hospitalized every one to two years. This caused my family and I to travel to the other side of Cuba to see my doctor. On our visits to Havana, we had to stay at my aunt's house where I was sexually molested by her husband when I was four years old. It went on for about five years until we ended up moving to Havana and two years later to the United States. Afraid and confused, disconnecting from my feelings, I pretended that it didn't happen and chose not to tell. I suppressed the memories so deep and never mentioned it to anyone until I turned 30. During my first marriage that lasted seven years, that was very abusive. It was a very long, painful process to unbury all the details of my abuse, but with the help of a counselor and my sponsor, I was able to deal with it. The lack of protection that I felt from my parents left me feeling abandoned and unable to trust anyone. I developed a, de a defense mechanism that helped me cope as a child. I call it process, numb, and escape. I learned at a very early age to disconnect emotionally to protect myself. This worked very well in my childhood, but it destroyed any possibility to have a healthy, long-lasting relationship as an adult. The sick part of being sexually abused is that God has hardwired our bodies to feel pleasure through sex, even when it's involuntary. That's, that's why all victims of abuse are filled with guilt and shame, somehow feeling responsible for the acts perpetrated against us. My innocence was stolen, my soul was violated, and my view of healthy sex was completely distorted. I felt dirty, damaged and unworthy. So I spent most of my life trying to clean myself up and prove that I was worthy. The question is, when is good enough good enough? Disney didn't help with their happy ever after stories. I searched for Prince Charming in every man I met, longing for a rescuer, a hero, a savior. Someone who would know me and love me for who I was. There was only one problem, I didn't even know who I was, and the little that I knew, I totally hated. My prince always turned into frogs, or better yet, I would pick the frogs and try turning them into a prince. I became very codependent. I had to be Miss Perfect to find Mr. Right. I completely lost my identity and became a performer in my own life. I had a mask for every occasion. I built a fortress around my heart to protect it. The only problem was that I became a prisoner in my own fortress. I was a functional dead person. Fear of failure and abandonment ruled my life. This made me very insecure, inconsistent, and unreliable. I emerged myself into dancing because it was the only way to express 
my passion, my anger, and my pain. I became a salsa instructor, a competitor, and a performer. Dancing was my drug. It gave me an amazing high. I felt beautiful and free. But the next day, I felt empty, tired, and alone. The hole in my soul got bigger and bigger. During my childhood abuse, my godmother took me to a beautiful Catholic cathedral in Cuba. This was my very first encounter with God. As I wandered through the gardens of the church, I was overwhelmed by God's presence. I didn't know him, but he sure knew me. Why couldn't I be like everyone else, I asked myself. They seemed to be so happy. I tried religion, but they wanted to change me from the outside in. They had a long list of rules that not even themselves could keep. Changing my behavior was not going to help me. I tried. I really needed an internal change, a heart transplant. My life had no purpose, no hope. It was a terrible joke. At 29, I found myself pregnant from a three-year relationship I had just ended. After having an abortion at 20, which left me with more shame and regret, I decided to have my child. I was about to become a single mom. I was a strong and independent woman. How hard could this be? I told myself. Three months into my pregnancy, I had a urinary tract infection, and I went to see my doctor, and he gave me two options, an abortion or bed rest. He said if I got a kidney infection like the ones I used to get, I would kill my baby, and I could die in the process of a miscarriage. What was I to do? How could I provide for my child and myself? So I decided to have an abortion. As only God could orchestrate, my boss was a Christian lady who was always telling me about the love of Jesus. When I got to work that day, without knowing anything about my conversation with the doctor, she said to me, the Lord woke me up last night and asked me to tell you not to be afraid because he would always be with you and your child and he would always provide for the both of you. That day, I took the biggest step of faith to trust a God I didn't even know, but who obviously knew me. I left my life as I knew it and moved back with my, to my mom's house to bed rest and soon to have my beautiful daughter, Samantha, whom God used to change my life. I went to church during my pregnancy, and on March 1998, after my daughter was born, I gave my life to Christ. I finally found my prince my Savior, my Lord, the one man who knows me completely and loves me for who I am, the God who believed in me when I couldn't believe in myself. At that moment, my kidneys were healed, and I have never had an infection since. He also replaced my love for salsa with a deep passion to praise and worship him. God awakened a deep desire to read his word in any literature that brings me closer to knowing him. I got baptized on November that same year, and I was on fire for Jesus. I wish I could tell you my life was perfect after that, but I had much to learn about myself and about Jesus. There are things that God, well, there, sorry, there are things that God heals instantly to show us who he is and other things that he will have us work through as we grow in him. Much like the thorn Paul spoke about when God said on 2 Corinthians 12, 9, my grace is sufficient for you, for it is, for it is in your weakness that my strength is made perfect. God uses my weakness to show his greatness. God shines through my brokenness, healing my wounds, and turn, turning them into scars that glorify his name. I have been divorced three times on the quest to finding Mr. Right. The insanity of doing the same thing, expecting different results. Obviously, my picker was broken. I had my amazing son Emmanuel from my second marriage, whom God used to bring me to celebrate recovery. As you all can imagine, I needed to fix my ex-husband. But little did I know that, I, that God was about to transform me. When I walked through those doors, I discovered my home. I finally found a place where I felt like I belonged. I thought to myself, if Jesus was on earth, this is where he would be. <laughs> of course, 
oh, I'm sorry, with the misfits, the outcast, and the broken, just like me. Of course, I sat on those chairs for a year before I finally decided to try a small group. After all, there was nothing wrong with me. I tried a couple of groups before I discovered the women's abuse group, where I finally realized that I wasn't alone, that I was not the only crazy person in this world. I found women with similar struggles and fears. I sat through the group and listened. I started praying for a sponsor, and God gave me the toughest available. But he knew I needed her. She didn't let me get away with anything. Many times I thought about quitting, but then I remembered how miserable I was, so I kept coming back. Working through my steps was very hard, but liberating. One time I was complaining to God about my pain, and he reminded me of the time I broke my arm and had it casted for 45 days. I had to go through 90 days of therapy, and therapy was painful. I didn't want to go back. But I knew that if I didn't, my arm would have been crippled. At that moment, I, God clearly asked me, how many areas of your life are crippled because you're unwilling to go through the pain? He got my attention. I finally understood the scripture found on Matthew 5.4. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. I finally understood there was no healing without pain. When I started recovery, I heard that the good news was that I was going to feel, and the bad news was that I was going to feel. Are you kidding me? Feel? I didn't, know, I didn't even know how to feel. Feeling was totally unfamiliar to me. As I kept coming back, the steps and the biblical comparisons came to life. I worked my steps with my sponsor for two and a half years because I had a lot to deal with. We cleaned out my closet full of secrets, pain, and shame. Today, I choose to keep the door open so that I'm not tempted to put anything in there that doesn't belong. My sponsor's consistency, grace, and commitment to challenge me and pray for me has made a huge difference in my recovery. I couldn't have done it without her and my accountability team. I am forever grateful for all the amazing women God has placed in my life. They challenge me. They hold me accountable. We laugh and cry together. We pray for each other when life gets tough. I took my walk to Emmaus six years ago where I, discovered, where I discovered God's unconditional love for me. I learned that his provenient grace, I, I, I learned about his provenient grace that pursued me even before I knew him. I went to Al-Anon for three years where I learned to set healthy boundaries and take care of myself. I learned to say what I mean, mean what I say, without saying it mean. I learned that no is a complete sentence. And uh, that I don't have to explain myself, nor apologize from, for living. I am learning to be slow to anger and quick to forgive. Not because people deserve it, but because it sets me free. I understand today that forgiveness is not for the person who hurt me but to liberate me from the prison of anger and resentments. Today, I enjoy much healthier relationships with my mother and father. I was able to forgive them and understand that they did the best they could with what they had. That they love me and they will always be there for me. My biggest struggle, obviously, was to forgive the man who sexually abused me as a child, especially because he's still part of my family. One day, I was crying out to God and told him that I was angry at him because he could have stopped the abuse and he didn't. At that moment, I was filled with the Holy Spirit and I was transported through a vision to a room where I was sitting on bed naked in fetal position, crying, feeling dirty and full of shame. Jesus was there. He covered me with his purple robe while I wept in his arms and he said, with a gentle whisper, yes, my child, I was there, and I died for your pain, and I died to heal you, but I also want you to know that I died for the men who hurt you, and I want you to forgive him. This was the hardest thing for me, because I didn't feel he deserved mercy or forgiveness, 
I was very upset at the fact that my abuser could spend eternity with me in heaven. He didn't deserve salvation. He didn't deserve forgiveness. So God reminded me that neither did I. Through much counseling and prayer, I chose to forgive him and still choose to forgive him today when the memory comes back or his name pops up in a conversation. I do not interact with that side of my family because they're in denial and I've learned that forgiveness does not equal reconciliation and boundaries are healthy. I enjoy a thriving relationship with both of my kids whom I love so much. They fill my life with challenges and joy. I love being a mother. I have taken parenting classes, marriage classes, classes to learn how to deal with my money God's way. Obviously, my life was insane and I had no idea how to do any of these things. Today, I know that life is much easier if I follow God's instructions that I can find in the Bible that I read every day. I practice my 12 steps and my principles and all my affairs. I am engaged to be married to Raul for the last time in Jesus' name. <laughs> God has used Raul to break the hardest of the strongholds caused by sexual abuse. We both have been led by God to surrender our sexuality to him and abstain from sex for a year until we get married. God is using this time to heal our distorted view of sex. Many people have asked me, why don't you just get married? But what good would that do? That would be a quick fix. There would be no surrender and therefore no healing. God is teaching me that intimacy has nothing to do with sex and more to do with being open and honest and allowing someone to see into me. He is showing me that I am more than a sex tool to be used for pleasure, that I can have Raul love me. Amen. That I can have Raul love me for who I am and not for what he can give, for I can give him. God is showing me that I can say no, that I am worthy, that I have value because he paid a high price for me. He is showing me to be a princess because I am a daughter of a king. Isaiah 118 says, come now, says the Lord, though your sins are like scarlet, I'll make them white as snow. The Lord keeps cleansing me. I've been on three mission trips. I am a part of the Nicar Grace operational team. I've served in many areas of the church. I continue to sponsor women in recovery and to the walk to Emmaus so that I can give away what was freely given to me. I love to pray. I get to experience the hand of God at work as he answers my prayers, especially when I get to pray over some of you. I believe that prayer is the greatest, greatest gift God has given to us. It is an honor that I don't take lightly. I get to have a conversation with the creator and sustainer of the universe. I have direct access to the throne of the Almighty through Jesus Christ. That's pretty amazing to me. Today, I co-lead the women's abuse group with many other amazing women with similar struggles, sharing my experience, strength, and hope with women that, I have, that have been through, through the pain of abuse is my passion. God takes our messes and turns them into a masterpiece. My favorite verse in the Bible is 2 Timothy 1.7. For God has not given me a spirit of fear, but a spirit of power, love, and self-control. If I don't change who I am, I will never become who God made me to be. I am no longer a victim, but a victor in Jesus Christ. Thank you for letting me share. Keep coming back. It works if you work it. So work it because you're worth it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.